On May 30th, 1940, in the heart of Britain, Armstrong Whitworth's deputy chief test pilot, John Oliver Lancaster, better known as Joe, took the reins of the first Armstrong Whitworth AW-52 prototype, TS-363. The weather that day was near perfect, with imposing cumulus clouds providing intermittent shelter. Strapped into an ejection seat, a new and untested innovation, Lancaster contemplated the risks ahead. Many doubted the efficacy of these seats in emergencies, but he forged ahead. Lancaster meticulously executed his series of tests, primarily in the speed range of 270 to 350 miles per hour at an altitude of 10,000 feet. As he initiated a shallow dive and approached 5,000 feet, turbulence unexpectedly engulfed his aircraft. Violent pitching and escalating oscillations rocked the cockpit, pushing Lancaster to the brink. With seconds that felt like an eternity, he made a critical decision to activate the ejection seat and abandon the aircraft. No one had ever done so successfully in Britain. As the world hurtled towards the era of modern warfare during the early 20th century, aviation pioneers were driven by a quest to push the boundaries of flight. One concept would stand out among their many innovations, the flying wing. The roots of the flying wing concept can be traced back to the brilliant mind of J.W. Dunn in the years before World War I. His groundbreaking ideas laid the foundation for a lineage of daring aircraft engineers, including G.T.R. Hill, who embarked on a journey of experimentation. But it was in the tumultuous 1920s and 30s that the concept indeed took flight, with Germany emerging as a hotbed of innovation. Dr. Alexander Lippisch, a visionary aerodynamicist, led the way with his experiments on unpowered sailplanes, exploring delta wing configurations that would later inspire generations of designers. In 1939, Dr. Lippisch joined forces with Professor Willy Messerschmitt, creating the ME-163 Comet. This rocket-powered interceptor fighter was agile but perilous for its pilots, owing to the volatile rocket fuels used in its Walter rocket motor. Meanwhile, the Horton brothers, Walter and Reimar, charted their own path to aviation history. Their Horton H-09, powered by embedded jet engines, achieved a historic milestone in February 1945 when it became the world's first true all-wing jet-propelled aircraft to take flight, years ahead of its British counterpart. As the war raged on, interest in flying wings persisted. It was then that Armstrong Whitworth recognized the potential of combining the flying wing configuration with two key innovations, laminar flow airfoils and turbojet engines. In the 1940s, amidst the fascination with flying wing designs like the Horton and Northrop creations, a quiet revolution was brewing in Britain. The Armstrong Whitworth AW-52 emerged as a groundbreaking experiment in aviation technology during World War II. This pioneering aircraft was the brainchild of John Jimmy Lloyd, the chief designer at Armstrong Whitworth Aircraft. Lloyd's journey began when the Ministry of Supply approached him with the unique challenge to design a full-scale wing capable of conducting laminar flow drag tests in a wind tunnel operated by the National Physical Laboratory an endeavor driven by the quest to unlock the full potential of the flying wing concept and harness the advantages of laminar flow wings and boundary layer control. Laminar flow wings, characterized by the minimal aerodynamic friction, promised smoother airflow over the wing surface, drastically reducing turbulence and drag. Boundary layer control further ensured optimal aerodynamic flow. However, achieving this vision was no small feat. Craftsmanship and surface finish had to be impeccable to maintain laminar flow airfoils, as even the tiniest imperfection could disrupt their delicate performance. Traditional airfoils had their maximum thickness near the leading edge, but laminar flow airfoils required it closer to the mid-cord position, making maintenance a formidable challenge. Despite these hurdles, the AW-52 project persevered, accumulating vital data and experience with the flying wing configuration. This effort supported Armstrong Whitworth's grand plans to develop a more ambitious project, a jet-powered flying wing airliner. Concurrently, another daring experiment unfolded with the iconic Hawker Hurricane II Z-3687. This legendary interceptor fighter was modified with laminar flow wings and boundary layer control. The laminar flow wing was expected to bestow enhanced speed and maneuverability on the Hurricane. Real-world testing of the Armstrong-Whitworth-designed laminar flow wing on the modified Hurricane revealed promising results. 
However, a significant challenge emerged as dirt accumulated on the wing, disrupting the airflow and diminishing performance gains. Undeterred, Lloyd pressed forward. He envisioned an airliner with a revolutionary design, a flying wing powered by buried jet engines to maintain optimal aerodynamics. This aircraft, conceived in 1943, was a giant in its time, boasting a weight of around 180,000 pounds and a wingspan of at least 160 feet. Its structure departed from convention, lacking a traditional fuselage or tail unit. This audacious design, resembling today's Boeing 737 family in size and weight, required extensive testing. The AW-52G, with its impressive 53 feet 10 inch wingspan, served as a testbed for exploring the low speed characteristics of the flying wing design. Constructed mainly from wood, this glider featured a central nacelle housing two intrepid pilots and two outer wing sections. Control was achieved through innovative wingtip elevons, combining the functions of elevators and ailerons, along with fowler flaps along the trailing edge. In March 1943, construction of the AW-52G began, and it was equipped with anti-spin parachutes at the wingtips to ensure safety during testing. Two years later, on March 2, 1945, the glider embarked on its maiden flight, towed into the sky by an Armstrong Whitworth Whitley bomber. This daring flight provided crucial data on the flying wing's performance, particularly its control and stability. However, the AW-52G couldn't reach the high-speed flight required for comprehensive testing. To bridge this gap, the Ministry of Supply contracted Armstrong Whitworth to produce two AW-52 prototypes for evaluation, intended initially for mail transport. Construction commenced in March 1944, and on March 2nd, 1945, the first of these aircraft took to the skies. One remarkable feature of the AW-52 prototypes was its complex automated pitch management system, which tackled a significant challenge faced by flying wing designers, trim changes caused by flaps. This system ensured stability and control, contributing to the success of the project. To lift the glider into the skies, they turned to a Whitley B Mark V bomber, LA-951, the last of its kind produced at the Baginton assembly line in July 1943, which had been retained by the company for experimental purposes. The success of glider trials paved the way for two upscaled and jet-powered research aircraft with a wingspan of 90 feet and a takeoff weight of around 20,000 pounds. The AW-52 was not just another aircraft, it was a pioneering creation that pushed the boundaries of aeronautical engineering. One of the most striking features of the AW-52 was its futuristic, tailless configuration. Though it wasn't a true flying wing, it embodied cutting-edge design principles of its time. It was powered by pure jet propulsion, featuring a 35-degree wing sweep back and an airfoil designed to maintain laminar flow over 55% of its cord. This laminar flow was essential for achieving high-speed performance. Intriguingly, the AW-52 incorporated boundary layer control over its control surfaces, ensuring smooth airflow even at high speeds. It boasted automatic pitch correction, thermal de-icing, and a fully pressurized crew compartment. The aircraft was equipped with a Martin Baker ejection seat, which made its debut in the UK during the AW-52's testing. The AW-52 featured Fowler flaps, spoilers, and elevons for precise roll and pitch control. The innovative design didn't stop with its aerodynamics. The manufacturing process of the laminar flow wing was equally groundbreaking. Instead of the conventional method, the wing was built in two halves, ensuring the outer skin maintained the required contour. This meticulous process resulted in an aerofoil with an error margin of only 0.002 inches. To control the aircraft's flight, elevons were introduced. Suction ducts on the upper wing surface aided in boundary layer control, reducing turbulent airflow. The cockpit, slightly offset to the port side, accommodated the pilot and flight observer in tandem, with the pilot having the privilege of the Martin Baker ejection seat. Underneath the wings lay two Rolls-Royce turbojet engines, although the first prototype featured Rolls-Royce Neen engines, each producing 5,000 pounds of thrust, while the second prototype, TS-368, was equipped with lower-powered Rolls-Royce Derwent engines, generating 3,500 pounds of thrust. This difference in engine power remains a mystery, possibly due to the availability and economic constraints of the post-war era. The AW-52 was more than just a research aircraft. 
It had the potential to serve as a mail carrier with its cargo space behind the cockpit. However, despite its visionary design, the trials of these prototypes yielded disappointing results. Laminar flow could not be maintained, limiting their maximum speeds. Additionally, takeoff and landing runs were longer compared to conventional aircraft due to the unique Elevon configuration. On December 16, 1947, at RAF Bittiswell, history bore witness to a remarkable event as Armstrong Whitworth unveiled their aviation marvel, the AW-52. The stage was set with a gathering of government officials, industry experts, and the watchful eye of the press. Squadron leader Eric Franklin, the chief test pilot, stood at the helm of this groundbreaking flying machine. With confidence radiating from Franklin, the AW-52 taxied gracefully to the takeoff point. As the engines roared to life, he unleashed the power of the Neen engines, lifting the aircraft sharply into the sky. The flight was nothing short of impressive, reaching altitudes of 600 feet and speeds between 200 and 250 miles per hour. Squadron leader Franklin's expertise shone as he executed low passes with finesse, culminating in a perfect nose-up touchdown at a remarkably slow landing speed of less than 100 miles per hour. This aircraft, designed for laminar flow and precision, had captured the imagination of all who witnessed its flight. Months later, in September 1948, TS-368 joined the test flying program, embarking on research into airflow behavior at Farnborough. Yet, not all was smooth sailing for the AW-52. Its Achilles heel emerged when it was discovered that its flutter speed was lower than expected, limiting its top speed to a mere 300 miles per hour, far from its predicted 500 miles per hour. The quest for laminar flow over the wings, crucial for the AW-52's success, proved elusive. Armstrong Whitworth's meticulous construction methods, with formers and alloy sheets, aimed for perfection but fell short. Turbulent flow may have triggered the dreaded flutter, and despite the precision in its wing skin production, the AW-52 remained devoid of RAF roundels due to the thickness of its paint. May 30, 1949 marked a pivotal moment as test pilot John Oliver Lancaster embarked on a daring flight aboard the first prototype of the Armstrong Whitworth AW-52. As the AW-52 hurtled through the skies at a blistering 320 miles per hour, Lancaster encountered a terrifying pitch oscillation, a menacing dance that seemed to threaten the very fabric of the aircraft. This oscillation, believed to be caused by Elevon flutter, started at two cycles per second and rapidly escalated to incapacitating levels. In the face of imminent structural failure, Lancaster made a fateful decision. He chose to eject from the aircraft using the Martin Baker Mark I ejection seat, becoming the first British pilot to employ this life-saving apparatus in a live emergency. However, soon after his exit, the aircraft miraculously ceased its erratic dance and glided down to land in open country north of Southam in Warwickshire, with surprisingly little damage. Yet, this heroic episode marked the beginning of the end for the AW-52. Disheartened by the disappointing results and the close brush with disaster, Armstrong Whitworth's management abandoned further development of the flying wing concept. Instead, they shifted their focus and resources toward the Armstrong Whitworth Apollo, a turboprop airliner with a more conventional configuration. The second AW-52 was consigned to the Royal Aircraft Establishment and later RAE Farnborough, where it continued its role in experimental flying. However, in June 1954, this pioneering aircraft met its end as it was scrapped. As we ponder the might-have-beens and what-ifs, we can only imagine how later technologies might have transformed the AW-52's fate. Today, it remains an often overlooked chapter in Britain's aviation history.